my name is Cheryl Osgood. I used to be following my way, but now I'm following the way. When I moved in with my grandmother, I was 15. I went to a whole new school, whole new culture shock. I had no friends for a while, but then the, the kids we called the burnouts, the ones that were into smoking pot and things like that, they kind of scarfed me up and took me in their life. That shaped my life for the next 30 years. I started following the way of the kids at school, and it was dark. I started going to concerts. That was my big thing, concerts. That was pretty much me, just in with that crowd, literally in with the dark crowd, because it was in the dark. Everything was dark. Everybody wore dark clothes. But a lot of times, my conscience or the Holy Spirit would say, this is wrong, and I would just kind of deny it. Like, well, what am I gonna do about it now? You know, here I am in this situation. I did have prior churching in a Protestant church when I was younger. And I knew there was a right way, the Lord's way. And still I chose to go the other way. And the farther I got into it, the harder it was to get out of it. I'll lose my friends. I could lose my husband. You know, am I ready to quit doing this because it's so much fun? And I pictured myself as a little old lady in a church. But in the meantime, I'm going to do this as long as I can. And maybe one day things will change. Things weren't changing. I was still in that lifestyle. And I could still picture myself with my cane rocking out at a concert. Once the Holy Spirit really got my attention. And I remember that time specifically because it was like overwhelming. And I think I was finally at a point where I was ready to, to hear it and ready to pay attention. I started making subtle changes. Then I started to watch David Jeremiah on TV. A lot of things came back to me that I remember hearing from church as a kid. I told Bill, my husband, I said, I don't really want to do this anymore. I don't feel like I can even come to another concert and I want to change things. I was following my way, thinking it was the right way, but then I learned the Lord's way, Jesus' way, the only way, the only truth. Now I'm walking in the light and everything is different. Everything is better. Then I find out I had cancer and I had gone through it once already, but this time it was different. It was stage four. It was in my liver. It was devastating, but God is helping me through this every step of the way. And I know he's there. I know he's taking care of me. I know he loves me. And I know when the end comes, he'll take care of me then, and I'll be in his arms first thing after I close my eyes that last time. Really looking forward to that too. It just, it sounds so exciting. Let's thank our sister, Cheryl Osgood, for sharing her story this morning. You can see Cheryl around here on a regular basis. She's uh, often in this room uh, filling uh, the little holders that hold the information in all of the pew backs. She'll make her way then to other places to volunteer. I've seen her painting walls and cleaning, and she does have this joy about her. What I loved was her story towards the end. Here's a woman facing cancer, very serious cancer. And yet she already has the end in sight. And there is a joy that radiates from her. And did you catch that phrase, the last time she closes her eyes here and she opens them? And, and she's excited about that. She's anticipating that. You know, one of the questions I get the most is, what is heaven going to be like? Well, actually, the passage we're studying today, we get a glimpse into heaven. We're in a series that we're calling Knowing Jesus. We're studying the I Am sayings of Christ. And today we're going to look at one of the most well-known sayings of the I Am sayings. I want to invite you to take your Bibles. Turn with me to John chapter 14. Verse 6 is the passage I was mentioning. It is a passage that speaks of the exclusivity of Jesus. He says, I am, 
And we understand the importance of that word, I am. It reflects back to the Old Testament encounter of God and Moses, where God introduces himself as his covenant name, I am, Yahweh. Jesus has picked that up, and he has identified himself as God. And so every time he says, I am, he is speaking of his deity. And in this case, it is the same. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now this is well known. This is well known because of its explicit exclusivism. It is a statement that there is no doubt Jesus is proclaiming he is the only means of salvation. We see that. And actually in all of the I am sayings, he is saying something very similar. It is an exclusive sense. I am the bread. In other words, there is no other bread. There is no other way to be spiritually nourished except through me. When he says, I am the light, he says, there's no other light. When he says, I am the door, there's no other door to go through. I am it. When he says, I am the good shepherd, he says, and by comparison, there are no other good shepherds. I am he. I am the good shepherd. And so what we have seen here is actually an over and over again statement of the explicit exclusivism of Jesus Christ. Now, there's no doubt that Scripture other, in other places states the exclusivity of Jesus. For example, in 1 Corinthians 3, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation for our salvation. Acts 4.12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Again, an exclusive statement. 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. So the exclusivity of Jesus Christ in all of the passages and all of the statements, in essence, stand on their own. And so what we are going to do today is not necessarily study the exclusivity of Christ. It is here. It is well stated. It's not going to be our focus. Instead, we need to focus on the framework on which this statement is made. Now, you've heard me tell you many, many times there are no single passages of Scripture that can be extracted and stand completely on their own without a context. Certainly, we can pull out, we can understand a truth, such as the exclusive claim of Christ, but it always is within a context. And so we need to be asking the question, why does he say it here? And what actually is he experiencing that causes him to say it? Well, to understand that, we have to go back a full chapter to chapter 13. And what do we see in chapter 13, verse 1? Where is he? It states this, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end during supper. And then it continues on. This is the last supper of Christ. He's sitting in a room with his closest disciples and friends when he says this particular statement. It's not necessarily a theological statement to the world. It's a personal statement to his friends. Now, we need to understand this. We need to see this clearly. Another event that takes place here that leads up to our particular passage is that Jesus proclaims once again with great clarity that he is about to die that in the next day he is going to the cross and he is going to die. This sends shock waves through the disciples. Now, we have the benefit of 2020 biblical vision. We can look back on all that the scriptures say and we can look into this and we can ask the question, well, why are they shocked? I mean, Jesus had been telling them over and over again he was going to die. Now he says it again during this supper. Why has it sent such shockwaves through the disciples? 
We look into some passages, for example, in Luke chapter 9, verse 22. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and killed on the third day, be raised. He says it very clearly. In Mark chapter 9, they went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the sayings and were afraid to ask him. Jesus was teaching the disciples over and over again that he was about to die. Now he makes this statement and suddenly it's no longer a teaching, it's a reality. And the mood in that room is heavy. I think they finally got it. Remember, they thought the Messiah was coming as a conquering king. So this idea of a dying Messiah was really not a part of their theology. And it hit them at the deepest level. And don't forget, they had left everything to follow him. Remember, that's what Peter says. We've left everything. Where are we going to go? Not only that, but think of all that you know occurred during the Last Supper. Well, the first thing that occurs, Jesus, the king of the universe, put on a robe, got down on his knees, and began to wash the the disciples' feet. They were embarrassed by that that they didn't think of it first, that they themselves did not act the servant. So so they're already a little bit embarrassed. And then Jesus says that one of them, Judas, is going to totally betray him. So there's now talk going around the table about the betrayal. And towards the end, even Peter, their leader, is going to deny him. And then Jesus drops this bombshell that he is about to go to the cross and die. And in just a little bit, he says, my little children, I will no longer be with you. You see, the heaviness is here in the room. All of this turmoil is in the room. Now, come back to chapter 14 and you're ready for it. You see, chapter 14 is an extension of chapter 13. He's with these same close friends and disciples. And he says to them, verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Their world is shattering around them. And what does Jesus do? Two things. First, he gives them words of comfort. Now, you need to see this in context for just a moment. What's going on in Jesus' world? Jesus is about to go to the cross, and he knows it. In just a few moments, he will be in the garden, and he'll be in such anguish, he'll be sweating drops of blood, and he'll be asking the Father, is this really your will? He himself is filled with his own anxiety and turmoil, and yet he sets that aside because he sees the disciples. Their hearts are troubled, and he offers them what? Comfort. But how does he do that? Well, notice verse 2. He says, in my Father's house, which is a reference to heaven. And so what is he doing? He's speaking of a future. You see, he wants to comfort them. How is he going to comfort them? He comforts them through things to come. Listen, he says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas was the first one to speak up. And he said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How are we going to know the way? Jesus says to him, and here it is. Here's the statement. I am Thomas, disciples, those of you in this room, I am your way. I am the way. And I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Do you see this passage of great exclusivity is actually set within a very tender moment that Jesus is teaching his disciples at a very critical time. Now, why is this such a critical time? Well, this is why this passage is so loved. This is a critical time because it was a time of great uncertainty 
Jesus was about to depart and they were feeling the anxiety of the moment. This is why we love a passage like this. Life is filled with all kinds of uncertainty. The phone might ring at any moment. We might receive a text. Changes the entire trajectory of our lives. We live in an uncertain world and we live in uncertainty in the midst of it. And here in this uncertain time, Jesus comes to his disciples. He said, how do we get through those uncertain times? Well, we follow the same pattern that Jesus uses in teaching his own. We're going to find that there are three movements in the text. There's a petition, a place, and a promise. And in this, we learn of comfort in times of uncertainty. Let's start with the petition. We see that in verse 1. Jesus says to his disciples, stop and believe. That's where he starts. Verse 1 is, in essence, a command. Look at it again. Let not your hearts be troubled. This is actually called an imperative phrase. Now, the imperative word is the word trouble. But the entire phrase is leading up to that. Let not, he says, your hearts be troubled. It's as if he's saying, stop. Now, he's not rebuking them from feeling troubled. That's a, that's a natural human emotion in the midst of uncertainty. But what he is saying is, stop being troubled. Now, the word troubled, interesting word, means to shake or to stir up. It can mean to mentally be shaken or stirred or to emotionally be agitated, or to be physically sick. Doesn't that describe trouble? I mean, when you are in uncertain times, how do you feel? Well, you feel emotionally shaken. You feel stirred up. You can sometimes feel a sense of even spiritual despair because of the uncertainty. It can even get to the point where it impacts you physically. Have you ever felt physically ill because of uncertainty in your life, that which you do not know, or what direction to go. That's the idea of trouble. And Jesus is ste stepping into the disciples' life, and he's looking into their hearts, and he's seeing they're troubled. And he says to them, like a kind heavenly father, stop. You know, as a father, I, I have to occasionally do that. Not in a harsh way with my children, but sometimes I have to come alongside them and just say, stop, don't let your mind get ahead of the situation. Don't let your emotions take control. Don't let yourself become physically ill over the stop. And that's exactly what he's commanding here. He's commanding, in a sense, stop what you're feeling and thinking. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, that's the second command. The second command is in the text. Notice, he says, believe in God, believe also in me. You say, well, isn't that somewhat vague? No, it hits right to the heart of the matter, doesn't it? It goes right back to the foundation. What do we know about God? That God is faithful. He's been faithful to us in the past. He'll be faithful to us in the present. He's going to be faithful to us in the future. And so what Jesus is doing is bringing back the reality. He says, don't forget about God. Believe in God. And oh, by the way, I am God. Believe in me. And I have made you certain promises. By the way, the scriptures contain 5,467 promises. If you ever walk through the Psalms, you know what you're going to find about the promises of God? That they're personal. Now, you can go all throughout the promises of Scripture, all 5,467. Not all of them are going to apply to you, and not all of them are going to be personal. But I love going through the Psalms, because they tend to be personal. This week, I was making my way through Psalm 91. I found eight promises that are personal to me. You're looking for a Psalm to study? You have uncertain times, Psalm 91. Find the eight promises that are personal to you. You see, Jesus is doing this here. He's saying this is personal. Stop. Stop moving forward. Stop your mind. Stop your heart. Stop your troubles. Go back to your foundation. 
believe in the faithfulness of your God. Now the next thing he does is somewhat interesting. He takes them out of the present and he moves them to the future to a place. And you see the transition in the text very clearly. He moves them out of today and he moves them into the future. In this place, he says, I want you to look towards your future reward. So he says, how do you handle this uncertainty and this trouble in your spirit? Well, first you stop, you believe in God, but then you focus your mind not on the present, but on the future. You see, where where is this? Well, he says this in verse 2, in my father's house, which, by the way, is a reference to heaven. It's a name for heaven. There's a number of names for heaven, a country, city, a kingdom, a paradise, a place of rest. And in this, he says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Now, do you see that word, many rooms? Unfortunately, in some of our older translations, the word mansion is inserted there. And we've picked that up in some of our singing. And we'll sing about our mansion in glory. You ever heard a song kind of like that? I hate to burst your bubble. There's not a mansion waiting for you on the other side. But there is a room. And the room actually is much more personal than a mansion. Because you need to understand their culture. You see, their culture is that A father who would be the owner of a house, if his son was getting married, he would not just have the son move out. He would actually take care of the son by building a room for his son and his bride and their soon-to-be family so that they could be one larger extended family. Do you hear what God is saying? He's saying, there are rooms in heaven for you because you are my extended family. Now, I actually have a living example of this. Uh, a while back, we bought an old farmhouse, 1894 farmhouse. And it has all the characters and the projects of an old farmhouse. Keeps us busy. But it's also a strange farmhouse because on the second floor, there's a hallway that literally leads to nowhere. And when you walk in, you're the this is the strangest thing. Why would they have a hallway that goes to nowhere? And they also used to have this light switch that would turn on the dining room light downstairs. We never could figure that out. Maybe it's their safety system. I'm not quite sure. But that's the old farmhouse. Well, it's kind of interesting kind of layout. And well, we ran into someone who actually knows the history of this old house. And they were telling us that years and years ago, back during the Depression, When the owner's son got married, he could not afford a house. And so what they did was they took a portion of the house, they chopped it off, put it on logs, and rolled it just across where my neighbor is. And That is strange, but it's the concept. They didn't have enough money for a house. They wanted his son to have a house, so they chopped off part of their house, and they rolled it over on the other lot. And sure enough, I went home, I stood in the, that, that hallway, which is now a window, and I looked over and I'm like, that's my house over there. <laughs> and that's the sense. The sense of the passage is the Father loves us so much that he has built on rooms for us. And Jesus is saying this to the disciples. He's saying, I understand your anxiety is because of my separation that I'm about ready to separate from you, but I want you to look towards your future reward. We're going to be together again. And we're going to be together in such a close proximity that you're going to have your own room because you're going to be part of the Father's house. Can't you wait to, can't you wait to see what this is going to unfold and look like? I mean, I I love how Cheryl said, she she, she said that when she closes her eyes for the last time, she's anxious, she's looking for it, she's excited. And she should be, because there's a future reward waiting for us. But wouldn't she love to have just a glimpse of heaven? Well, you actually can. In Revelation chapter 21, we get a glimpse of what heaven is going to look like 
I want you to turn over there just for hold your place in John because we're going to flip right back. But in Revelation 21, John, the author of Revelation, is caught up into heaven. And he has a glimpse of what is to come. And it's one of the most fascinating portions of Revelation. It includes measurements. The base of the city that we're going to read is uh, two million square miles, about half the United States. And he sees this coming out. He says, look at the vision. I'm going to pick it up in verse 9 and just read for a little bit. So then came out of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I'll show you the bride the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like the most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. And it had a great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. Can't you just see this? He says, on the east three gates, and then on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. And the city lies four square, its length the same as the width and he measured the city with its rod, 12,000 stadas. Its length and its width and its height are equal. He also measured the walls, 144 cubits by human measurements, which is also an angel's measurements. I love that. I have no idea what it means, but there's an angelic measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second was sapphire, the third was agate, the fourth was emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysalis phrase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the city of the street was pure gold, transparent as glass. Now you might be thinking, does it really look like this? Oh, I hope so. Because this is cool. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And this city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. And they will bring into the glory and the honor of the nations but nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now you can keep reading. It goes on. It's a beautiful picture. And why do I bring you this, bring you to this passage? Because I want you to see a future. You say, well, isn't this just kind of like escapism? You know, shouldn't we be living in the reality of today, not the escapism of the future? That's not what Scripture does for us. Scripture over and over tells us we ought to be keeping our eyes focused on the eternal glory. For example, in 1 Peter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, speaks of the future, that is imperishable. By the way, that's Peter's favorite word in chapter 1. Everything is imperishable. Unfading, or rather undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. And then Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, not here. Constantly, Paul is 
telling us to look towards the future. That's where our hope lies. For it, we wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, that's earthly, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What does he do? He tells us to focus on the future. Are you living in uncertain times? Do you have an uncertainty about your life today? What does Jesus Christ say? Stop. Stop your mind. Stop your heart. Believe in God. Focus your attention on a place. Look towards your future reward. Now, I don't know if you saw this. Flip back to John. You'll see that he offers a number of promises to them from verses 2 through verse 4. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. What is that? It's the promise of heaven. Your room. Then he says, I will come again. What's that? That's the promise of Christ's return. I will take you to myself. What's that? That's the promise of the rapture. When he says, you will be with me, what kind of promise is that? That's the promise of personal presence. The very thing they were most concerned about, he says, I will be with you. I'm coming back. He's settling their uncertain hearts. And then the last thing he does, he points them to the promise. And I want you to see most of all that the promise is Jesus Christ. And the promise is personal. Remember, it's personal to you. Let me show you this. All the pronouns are moving towards verse 6. Six times he uses the personal pronoun you. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I'll take you to myself where I'm going, you may be also. You, 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 you. Six times. Well, it's Thomas is the one who steps into the ring. He's the first one to ask the question. And he says, Lord, where are you, where, where are you going? We don't know where you're going. We don't know how to get there. He asks the question that all of us are thinking. All right? If this is a personal promise, if Jesus is a personal promise, and Jesus is about ready to leave, well, how do I get, how do I get to be with Jesus again? How do I fulfill this promise? Well, by the way, this is not the first question. There are four questions in this short text, starting in chapter 13, verse 36. Peter says, where are you going? Then we see this question of Thomas. How can we know the way? Just a few verses later, in verse 8 of chapter 14, Philip says, will you show us the Father? Down in verse 22, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, uh, the other Judas says, well, why are you showing us this and not the whole world? There's questions, questions, questions. But the question that Jesus answers is Thomas's question. And how does he answer it? Well, notice we're back at verse 6. You see, this is very personal. Thomas wants to know how to find Jesus once he leaves. You see, this isn't just a statement about the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. It's a personal statement to Thomas, his disciples, and you. Look at verse 6. Read it in a personal way. Thomas, I am the way. Now, what does the way indicate? That there's something from point A to point B. He's saying, I've got this. I am that way. He says, I am the truth. No abstraction here. No fuzziness. This is the truth. And I am your life. You will find life in no other place but me. What's the promise? Follow Jesus. He knows the way. Are you following Jesus? Then in the midst of your most uncertain times, he says, I am your way. I am your way in salvation. I am your way in life. 
I am your way to eternity. I'm it. You see, what the promise is, is the promise is Jesus. Come back to Jesus. Follow Jesus. Put your trust in Jesus. We might not know how to go from point A to point B, but Jesus does. We might not know what true is truth and what is not truth, but Jesus does. We might not know what life means, but Jesus does. So he's constantly pointing his, the way back to himself. And in this personal context with his disciples, he makes one of the most amazing statements. In verse 7, he says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. For now on, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. He said, I and the Father are one. It's the claim of deity. He says, if you are following me, you are following God. So the question is, are you? You cannot resolve the text without turning it outward and facing yourself. Are you? Very personal text. As if Jesus is standing next to you. And he's saying, I am the way. I am your way. I am your truth. I am your life. Are you going to follow? In a few moments, at the end of our service, we'll have pastors down front who would love to talk with you, answer questions about Jesus being your personal way, truth, and life. For those of you who have already and could stand categorically saying, Jesus is my way my truth, my life. My prayer this week has been that this would be a comfort, that in uncertain times you return to the one who is the savior of your soul. He knows the way. Let's stand together. Oh God and heavenly Father, I thank you for the simple truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that he continues to be our way, not only in and as the means of salvation, but in and as the means of life. In the uncertainty, may we hear his voice tell us to stop and to believe in him. May we hear his voice tell us to look towards the future but may we hear the personal and the most profound promise that the answer is Jesus. May that simple message be comfort to our souls in uncertain times. Draw those to yourself who may not know you at such a personal level. We wait for you and your word to do its work. In Jesus' name, amen. This has been a message from The Chapel in Akron, Ohio. For more information about The Chapel or to listen to more of these types of life-applicable messages, please go to our website at thechapel.life.